looking at the English lexicon, the vocabulary of English, at conservatively 615,000 words. So we're going to ask the question, how did we get this enormous vocabulary? How does it compare to other languages' vocabulary? How did English come to be the English that we know today that is the dominant global language? So we're going to first look at what the linguist Geoffrey Hughes has to say. He says, words surround us in their myriad multiplicity, the common and the rare, the local and the alien, the ancient and the new, the philosophical and the technical, the private and the political, the sacred and the profane. Where have they all come from? Which at last count amounted to more than half a million words. Well, in actual fact, there's uh, <clears throat> an alternative view to this. Do we really know how many words exist in a language? And there is an American uh, um, society called the Global Language Monitor. And they, a couple of years ago already, said we have passed the millionth word in English. So if you're interested, unfortunately I can't get to this, um, to the uh, blackboard, but you can go on www, just, it's very nice to, to look at this, dot language monitor, all one word, dot com. And then you can listen to the, the, the story about this millionth word, weird word that it was too. All right, so, Geoffrey Hughes is telling us that he's kind of going according to the Oxford English Dictionary, that 600, no, say 650,000 entries, more than what he said, 615, but let's take his conservative uh, uh, thing first. We look at other languages, because how did we come to be this top of the pops, this top of the pile here? English, okay, we're gonna take the conservative, 615,000 words. Japanese, 500,000. Chinese, 370,000. Dutch, 430,000, Italian, 270,000, German, 135,000, French, 100,000, and Spanish, 100,000. Oh, this would knock the French, you know, there's always this, oh, so different, so French, and they're so linguistically proud. They don't want any, anything uh, uh, infecting or affecting their language. These other languages, these languages are certainly changing because of the globalization of English. You are finding the French are starting to borrow words as English is so, we will see, such a, a great borrower. The Spanish are starting to borrow words as well. So we're watching, their vocabulary is gonna be growing, but it's gonna take a long time to catch up to where we have got to. So I'm just going to look at why do we say English is the global language now? What makes a language global? This word itself, the, the phrase global, the global English, the global language, actually only came into being about 30 years ago. The first books written about global English as a, as a topic, only 1990s early 1990s. So, so this notion, what, where does it come from? What makes, makes us able to say we are a global language? First of all, English is the most studied foreign language, which shows it's going into pockets all over the globe, making it global. English is the official language of aeronautical and maritime uh, communications. Many business ventures will be conducted, negotiations in English, international advertising, and of course, much of the internet. Originally, the internet started uh, with English and was 100% English, and of course, now, uh, there's a lot of um, things that are put on the internet from all over, multilingual stuff, so it's about 30%, but that's still pretty, pretty big when you consider how big the uh, internet is. English is the official language of the UN, and other international organizations. When we think about uh, the UN be being, uh, coming into being in the 1940s, there were 50 countries at that time. Now there are more than 200 members of the UN. Nations, countries need to talk to each other. They come from different, they have different cultures, different languages, so how do you talk? Where's the common ground? So English, the standard English, the English that we would consider as the English of the written word, the English of um, negotiation, that's our standard English, no dialects there. Let's look at the stats. Stats are very nice, I'm not a statistician, but I always love these things, you know. So, at the moment, we're looking at 
as uh, mother tongue speakers, the US, the UK, the etc. <coughs> stands for um, your Canada, your um, New Zealand, your Australia added into the mix there, where it is a mother tongue uh, language. Mother tongue would be meaning that it is the native language <coughs> of that uh, person, that, that group. If I could just have got to there, but I will just tell you the first Latin word that I'll introduce you to. I'm sure some of you have done Latin. How many hands up Latin? Yay! <laughs> Wonderful. It's a sad indictment that uh, actually we, we have very small classes of Latin, but it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that people are still interested in words and doing word power and origins of words from Latin and Greek. Anyway, so the first Latin word I can tell you and remind you of is the word nasci natus, which is to be born. So when we talk about the native, I am a native of Cape Town, I am a native speaker of English, that would mean it is the language that I was born with, it is the place where I was born. So we're talking about mother tongue speakers, look at that, 360 to 400 million. Then we're adding to that second language speakers. English for them is a second language, you're looking at uh, 150 to 300 million. And what we will see a little bit later is that um, when countries, peoples, uh, adopt a language as, say, a second language, they also adapt it. So we have the Indian English changing slightly the grammar, slightly the pronunciation. An Indian uh, speaker is going to say, I am going to the shops. Now, we will all understand, I am going to the shops. But they will put their own spin because they want to adapt it. They want to have some sort of identity. We've done the same with South African English. We have our own little notions of um, go to the robot, turn left. People say, what is, what is this robot? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, we've got our own identity. We have our own pronunciations as well. And this is what happens around the world. Singaporean English. You've got Australian English, New Zealand English. And we are basically talking about, well, even, even in the UK. How many, how many varieties of English would you find there? Liverpudlian English. You know, there's all sorts of things. So when I'm talking about English, we all understand each other. The English, we can understand. Then you're looking at third language, where English, for these uh, countries, these peoples, would be a third language. They, they, they've got other interventions there. And this brings us to about two billion, okay? Two billion speakers. Not all as first language or native speakers, but put them all together. English is global. We look now, I said first of all, that uh, English was, is by far the most studied language in the world. And we compare it, we've got one and a half billion, conservatively, learners of English as a foreign language. One and a half billion, eh? Look at French, 82 million studying French. And it's such a lovely language, but it doesn't come anywhere close to people wanting to speak English. Spanish, 14 and a half million. Italian, 8 million. Chinese, 30 million. German, 14 and a half. Japanese, 3 million. I think it's a very hard language, that. All right, so now, before we get onto words themselves, and I know you all love words, I know that's why you're here, and we're going to see, where did English, this language, which we've just seen has become the global language, where did it start? How did it develop? So we're going to have a little look at that. I'm looking, I'm not going to take you all the way back to Proto-Indo-European and blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm going to look at the important historical and uh, cultural events that have impacted on our English language. So we're going, to, we're going to start with an invasion. And we're going to see that actually so much of the linguistic development in English was as a result of invasions on Britain. So we are, we are leaving the shores of South Africa for the moment. We are going to Britain, which was called Britannia. And the uh, inhabitants of Britain were the Celts. They had 350 BCE migrated from Europe and landed in this lovely lush um, place which is called Britannia. And they were called the Britons, okay? They were living very happily there. Yes, very nice. And what happened? Oh, well, the Romans, Roman Empire was growing, expanding its powerful, powerful empire. This 
a Roman occupation, first of all, and another word if you're interested in words, occupation. You know, we're talking about what is your occupation as a profession. No, 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 no. When you talk about occupations from Latin occupare, to forcibly seize. So we're talking about the occupation of Britain. The Romans come in, in 46 AD, and they colonize. Oh, it's such a dirty word now, isn't it? Colonial, colonialism, colonize, ay, ay, ay. All anybody wants to do is talk decolonization. Anyway, let's just take it and make it neutral. <laughs> the word colonize comes from a Latin word colore, meaning to inhabit or to cultivate and a colonus was a farmer. So they came in very uh, of sort of uh, militaristic, of course, they're gonna take power, but then they colonize Britain. They leave people there, they leave the settlers there. That is what co colonization is about, you leave settlers. And what do the settlers do? They bring their language, they bring their culture, and they impose it on the peoples who are there, because actually, we're the boss now, see, that's, a, that's how it is. So the Romans came in. Strangely enough, I mean, the Romans had been in before. Big Julie, Julius Caesar, he had uh, invaded Britain in 55 BCE, um, but he didn't stay. He had his battles and off he went back. They were pressing problems back home. Anyway, so this is the important first, second invasion of uh, Britain, and it lands up that the Britons, stay, the, the Romans stay there. We call the Roman Britain. They stay in Roman Britain. Uh, right until 410. As I say, they impose their language, they impose their culture. Now, commercial dealings will be done in Latin. Hmm. We will have Latin as the language of diplomacy. Latin will be in the schools. Well, of course, the schools were, were very narrowly um, um, afforded only by the, the rich, etc., and the boys. So, but the language of scholarship, Latin. Okay, what do you do? You, you, you don't have any, any say about that. You just say, okay, okay. We see it in history. We, we see it all the way through. We'll come to that later. The weird thing for me is that they were settlers for a long time. So we're talking about settling, bringing you in. You're a soldier. You, you set, you've got to go and stay over there. And so you bring your family across. And then you have children. And the children have children. So the people become assimilated. They actually become Britons themselves. So when the Romans withdrew because of pressing problems back home now, as the empire was having a lot of difficulty um, holding its borders, you would have thought that there would have been hundreds of words of Latin origin that stayed behind because linguistically, Latin had been imposed and what people do is they anglicize, well not anglicize it, they, they sort of worked with it and mixed it with some Celtic words and you'd have thought that there would be hundreds of Latin words of Latin origin. <laughs> no, in fact, definitely not more than 200, but of, of um, common words that stayed in, that have stayed in our English, no more than a handful. And that's weird. So I can't call this a, a really important invasion, but let's look at what, what happens. What, are the, what do the invaders bring with them? Oh, they want the food that they like, for sure. They want the drinks that they are used to. And so they bring in their food, they bring in their drinks, and of course the Romans were great road builders, they were uh, castle builders and so on. So let's look at the, the words. So the original inhabitants were the Celts. The Celtic languages, as they developed, are now Welsh, Irish, or Scottish. How did, how did they get to be so different? from either English, Latin, what, what, what. We'll see that as a response to these invasions, those Celtic peoples who did not wish to assimilate with the people who had, had uh, invaded them, who did not want anything to do with it, they moved northwards. They took their language with them and they separated into groups and geographical dislocation causes building up their own dialect, their own language. So that's why you've got this, people down in South London are not gonna understand somebody who's speaking Welsh, no, not at all. I wouldn't either, actually. All right, so very few words of Latin origin survive. Ah, the first one, castra, a camp. We will see in this, we, we obviously try, what, what happens over time is an anglicization of words. From castra, 
we get place names. Custler means a camp. So it means that if you've got some, a, a place that's got a chester or a caster as a suffix, you can be sure that there is a Roman fort, ruins, go and ask them, well, tell, show me where's the Roman ruins, okay? So Winchester, Lancaster, Doncaster, we know Romans were there. So they left that behind. The word strata, meaning street from stratum, level. Uh, this, we know they were great uh, builders of roads. So when we talk about Stratford-on-Avon, uh, that was a street that the Romans originally built. And Avon, we'll see, comes from uh, a word meaning river. Not, not a Roman word. Kaisus, here comes the foodstuffs. You know, when, 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 when you go somewhere, oh, you're gonna, go, let's say you go to Italy, you want to eat Italian food. Oh, lovely, it's something different. But you've been away for quite a long time. You come back and the first thing you do is you have a braai because you want your own food back, okay? You, want, you identify with the tastes and so on. So kaisus, meaning cheese, they took that word, and it's, it's corrupted over time, of course, to the spelling that we know today, but when we look at the etymology, that's where it comes from, thanks to the Romans. It's very weird that the British, the, the Celts, had cows, they knew about milk, but they actually hadn't figured out this cheese story until the Romans came. <laughs> then we look at butrium, butter. Again, they gave their, 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 their knowledge to say, oh, but you can, now you can make butter, this is very nice, to spread on your bread, and there's cheese. And of course, most important, vinum, yay, okay, vinum. The, pardon? Oh, yeah, well, now, yes. Um, vinum was what the Romans brought in, and we wonder, or maybe you wonder, why uh, it has come to be called wine, okay? Because we've got the Latin phrase, in vino veritas, okay? Which is truth in wine. Be careful what you say when you've had too much to drink. You can give a lot of family secrets away. You can trash the name. So, but in actual fact, if I were teaching you Latin, the V in Latin was pronounced W. So it would be in vino veritas. So when the Romans came and said, oh, look what I've got a present for you, and here is some vinum. And they said, oh, that's lovely, thank you, so we'll have wine then. So it was wine. That's where the W sound comes from, our Latin. Discus, a dish, obviously, we see that in, in, in sport, the, the discus, in throwing the discus, it's a dish, you know. Uh, but that's where the word comes from, softened uh, through now to English. All right, so now the Romans have gone, gone back home. <laughs> and the Celts are so excited. We can take our language back. We can take our country back. I'm so pleased about this. And they just relax. Oh boy. Britain was too attractive to other places. And we have an important period. This is the sort of uh, very important period in the development of English and uh, giving us the classification of English as we will talk about now. This is the Old English period, also known as the Anglo-Saxon era. When we talk about Anglo-Saxon, we usually talk about the whole culture as well as the language, all of that. Ang the Old English is talking about the type, the, uh, more linguistically speaking. So 450, ah, I only had 40 years of peace, man. Anyway, 450, Germanic tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes come and invade Britain. So what are they gonna do? Once again, impose their language, impose their laws, demand that commercial dealings are done in their own language. So basically the poor Celts are underdogs once again. So here we have the three, the three um, Germanic tribes with slightly different dialects. And it's funny that we don't call it the Anglo-Saxon Jutian, era. Uh, I don't know why the Jutes didn't get a name in there. But anyway, talk about Anglo-Saxon. So they are ensconced. They have brought their language. Those Celts who did not want to assimilate and deal with that went northwards. But we have, of course, um, uh, the language being imposed and the people are starting who live there are starting to adjust to it and uh, Accept the words. These are Germanic tribes. So this is where the, the actual um, classification of English comes. 
that English is a Germanic language. You know, there's, people maybe think, oh, I've heard that uh, English has got over 70% of words of Latin and Greek origin, so surely, must be maybe a Romance language is the origin. No, it's Germanic because of this invasion, very strong, uh, strong identity that this, these Germanic tribes had. Oh, sorry, let me just go back to that. In this period, although the, um, uh, the people were, were, the Anglo-Saxons were living in Britain, they were considered now the Britons, okay, highly Germanic, nevertheless, the Romans did not let go their hold because of the uh, Christ Christianization, because of, of um, the need or the, the, the desire by the Roman Catholic Church to actually convert the heathens. It would be ridiculous to say that there was no Christianity in Britain already. The Romans brought it in earlier on. But when the Anglo-Saxons came, they were considered the heathens. So St. Augustine was sent over in 597 to start a process with his monks and set up monasteries to convert the, um, the heathen Anglo-Saxons. Uh, this, of course, is going to bring in many words of Latin origin and of Greek origin, which become anglicized, but the, the uh, hymns, the liturgical things, anything ecclesiastical was, was done in Latin and Greek. So the language of scholarship was Latin and Greek. So you may say, but what about if you were just like an ordinary person in the street and you've converted to, to Christianity, to Roman Catholicism, so, but, but you don't know Latin, you don't know Greek. It would be a matter of you would learn the chants, you would learn them off by heart. It's like there are many hymns. I'm sure you could sing. Have you, have you been to to graduation ceremonies and you sing Gaudeamusigitur? And do you know what those words all mean? <laughs> okay, but you know the song, you know the tune, and it's lovely. And this is exactly what would happen. So this this Christianization, this conversion, this push to convert, brought a lot of words in of Latin and Greek origin that people could kind of recognize, and they would use them in the church services, but they stayed behind. And we'll see what happens to those words uh, as we move along. They now say, okay, listen, we've been here for a while now, Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. We're not going to call it Britannia anymore. We're going to call it Angleland. And this, la this language that has evolved, we're going to call it English. And over time, that corrupted to England and to English, which is, so you've got Britain, England, same thing. All right. And English is the uh, language, the dialect that was evolved. We have, at this period, between 50 and 60,000 words in common use. Now, when we talk about words in common use, I've said that, okay, the Oxford Dictionary is going to give us 615,000, the, the Global Language Monitor is going to give us a million words. But I mean, I don't know the million words or the 100, 615,000, but we have a lot more, a lot more words than this in common usage. It, 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 it goes uh, hugely, um, grows hugely. For us but so this is pretty pretty small eh? pretty small so what gets us to to um, to a large lexicon that we have in this period this old English period only about three percent of words were borrowed from other languages okay because there wasn't that huge drive for colonization okay we've had the, the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes coming in but People were not borrowing from, from all over the place, okay? Only 3% of the words, so pretty linguistically insular. Another invasion occurs, which is kind of, I, I would put them almost together, it's the Viking invasions of the 8th and 9th century, because the, these invaders come from the Scandinavian countries, and that's also, if you were looking at family tree of languages, they also fit into the Germanic group. So, so there's a kind of a, an identity there. But they bring in words of, of their own too. So Britain is once again invaded and they bring in words from Old Norse. Very common words. Happy, husband, knife, mistake, scare, 
wrong, awkward gift. Now we look at this knife. So, whoa, if I was going to invent a word, would I put K-N together? No, but they actually pronounced that. It was knif. When we look at awkward, you, they pronounce it, they put the, it's difficult for us. You look at wrong, that was pronounced. So, but you're going to assimilate this language, you're going to adapt it, change it a little bit, and that's going to bring in change of pronunciation. So just a little, this is a little aside, um, with this invasion, settlements in Britain with Danish names. You've just seen the Casters and the Chesters and all that from Latin, okay? If anything ends in a B-Y, as in Derby, Grimsby, Rugby, where this rugby was first developed in, the, in that school, that would mean a farm or a town. So the town of Derb and the town of Grims. Thorpe was a village, so you've got Althorpe, Linthorpe, Thwaite is a clearing, Braithwaite, Applethwaite. There's a farm out, out in Elgin called Applethwaite. I've been there. They, guess what they grow? Apples, right. Anyway, so there was, obviously it was a clearing and they go, uh, grew apples. So personal names as well from the Viking era, son or son, uh, meant son of, so Davidson, Jackson, Henderson, that is coming from our Viking invasion. Ooh, now we come to a very exciting, not only an invasion, I shouldn't say invasions are exciting, I'm really, I'm, but anyway, it, yes, there's an invasion going to happen, but also linguistically, culturally, a huge, huge um, impact here on the English, which has been given to us or developed via the Angles and Saxons, the Germanic tribes. This is called the Middle English period. So we've had the Old English period, now we've got the Middle English period. And it begins with the invasion by the Norman French, 1066. What was that battle? Hastings, yes, I love your history, yes. Okay, 1066, Battle of Hastings. King William, who was subsequently called the Conqueror, the epithet, the Conqueror, because he conquered. Um, King William I invaded Britain, and he had that whole thing with Harold, you know, shooting out the eye. And, you know, Harold, Harold is, is no, he's, he's out. The English kings are out. So, King William is the Conqueror, and as, as is wont to happen, you're bringing along into this country. You are the conquerors. You impose your language. You impose your laws. You impose your rules about schooling. All of that, okay? They bring this in. The French, the Norman French. In this period, hundreds of words of French origin flood into English. And we're going to see, of course, they will become anglicized. But what William the Conqueror does as the king, he says, French, not Latin. French will be the language of instruction in schools. Latin for the scholarly, all right? So you could still do Latin. Very nice to be bilingual in those times. He says, the language of diplomacy will be French. Language of business will be French. Okay, so French is very, very powerful. But we have to give King William a little bit of credit here. King Willie says, in French of course, I want to learn this language, English. And he tried, and he tried. He was 43. I don't know, maybe 43 is a bit, when you get older, it's difficult to learn a new language. I don't know, I don't know. But, you know, he tried and tried until eventually he threw up his hands in typical French fashion. Oh, no, 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 no more. He said it was too difficult. So he insisted now everything had to be French. Might have been different had he found it easy to learn English, but no, no, no. And it is said in this period or the period of the French kings that they, they did not communicate in English at all. They were now not interested. The only thing that they ever used in English was swear words. That's all, just swear words. So it is the, 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 the language that is compulsory in schools as well. Latin remains the language of scholarship because Latin is still the language of the church. And as I say, in the schools, it is the language of uh, scholars. In the 13th century, yay, England regains the crown. They've got their 
the country back. Okay, but of course, at this time, you, as happened with um, the old English and even the Roman invasion, you've had assimilation with uh, families staying, settling, becoming assimilated to England. So you have, it is said, that there were some um, of the nobility who actually spoke in English and learned French at school, although their origin was, their family history was still French. That is how much they had assimilated uh, at, at this period of, um, in the 13th century. So we have England regaining the crown. What are you going to do first? What are you going to do? Say, hey, 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 I don't want my children to be doing French. We are English. We want them to learn English at school. So English is reinstated as the language of the masses, the language of school. And we have English being, of course, the language of the um, courts, etc. It's all claimed back. It's very, very nice. Big, big thing happening here, too. So they've got English back. OK. Latin is the language of scholarship. What do people read, these scholars, the learned ones? What, 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 what literature? Where, where's the literature? It's going to come from your Virgils and Caesars, the Latin texts. It's going to come from Greek texts, Homer, Hesiod. Where, where can the masses, where can people read anything in English? They've got to rely on the importing of the literature that we respect very highly. They've got to rely on that. So, in walks, or in comes Chaucer and his Canterbury Tales. Langland peers the plowman, and they write in English, in the mother tongue. And suddenly, literature, stories become accessible to the masses. Not that they could all read, okay, not that they at this moment could read, but they could listen to the stories, they could have the stories told to them in their own language. So there's this growing kind of nationalism, God, we are seeing that around the world, aren't we? Growing nationalism, linguistic pride, linguistic pride in their language. And they're so happy. We've got our own texts, yay. We have problems, though, uh, in the area of grammar, in the area of spelling, okay? and in the area we'll see of pronunciation, okay? So, just to take you back a little, little moment, English is classified Germanic language. So what happens with the grammar is the people who taught grammar would be the teachers in schools who were originally Latin, teaching the Latin. So they taught the grammar kind of according to the Latin grammar that they knew. So those of you Latinists, you would know very clearly what a gerundive is and what a participle is. And it's all coming from Latin and we put it into English and then we can work it out, okay? But it was also, the, the they did not keep the word order, they kept the Germanic wor word order. And what they did is they um, took the, the grammatical gender that we get masculine, feminine, neuter in Latin. They took that away, and they gave logical gender, all right? So that made it easier. Also, in German, the emphasis in speaking would be on the first syllable. So Germanic languages also have inflected endings like Latin. They've got endings, all right? Latin's a language of endings. German, language of endings. But this, this period, giving us the words that are coming in, people are saying them with an emphasis on the first syllable, and that means the second and last syllables drop away. People can't hear them, okay? They can't hear them properly. So slowly but surely, the loss of inflection. English is starting to be simplified. Let's not keep all of those Germanic endings now. Let's simplify it. You know, let's, if it's going to be plural, let's make it S, or ES, or whatever, a few tricky ones, but yeah. So there's coming in a simplification of the inflected business. And then this thing here, pronunciation, the great vowel shift. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a topic, if you're um, a 
linguistic person to study. You could study this as a topic for a long time. The great vowel shift, it, it's exactly what it says. For some reason, the vowels shifted in their sounds. This is a linguistic thing that happens in every language over time. It's not just then, it still happens today. So, for example, as I mentioned, we had the Viking word knife, which we say knife, was kniff. A knight in shining armor was a knicht. Now, now, if I say knight, you're going to say, well, which one do you mean? Do you mean dark? Do you mean knight in shining We have to clarify, because they sound the same. Huh? The word name was originally, ori originally spelt nom, uh, pronounced nom as in calm. Now we've got name, OK? So problem, what do you think is going to happen here? The problem is, with the change of pronunciation, there is not the same change in spelling. So we stuck with the spellings, thank you so much. Uh, English, difficult spellings, <laughs> because we've taken these words on and there was a shift in the vowels. I mean, I even have this um, to tell you what happens even today. I have a, a, a daughter in America, and so I have a granddaughter whose name is Daisy. And you know, we've got diaspora, you've got all the people spread around the world, you rely on Skype. So, some while ago, I was talking to Daisy, who's, who at that stage was seven, and uh, I said, Daisy, do you mind, I'm just going to go downstairs and get some water. She says, Gaga, it's not water, it's water. <laughs> <laughs> there you got it, you see? And then I've got another daughter who lives in Australia, and uh, so she now is a teacher, primary school teacher, so she comes from South Africa and she's teaching these little kids. And the, the headmistress calls her and says, Leanne, you know, you are really a brilliant teacher, I have to say. But the only problem is, the children can't understand some of your sounds. I need you to flatten them, OK? So now she says, I'm going to park the car. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And park the car? And when I listen to little Jacob, my grandson, I sometimes have to decode this. Just repeat. Let me write it down, because I can't get some of those pronunciations. So it happens still today. So now, there is a move towards standardized spelling. OK. Because our, our spelling, pronunciation, you can't just phoneticize it. The Americans try very hard, but you can't uh, phoneticize everything. And so there's a move towards standardized spelling. People, there's no dictionaries yet. So where, where do we rely? For how do I spell this word? Well, you know, you might spell it one way, because you're listening to it. And you might say, no, 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 not spelled like that. It's spelled like that because there's no standard. So another very important thing in the development of English is going to be standardizing the spelling. Look at this. We've exploded, we've doubled the number of words in English. About 120,000 words. Whew. From 50 to 60 to 120. Why? Because we've taken in words from French, very freely, anglicized them. Do you remember, by the way, when you are looking at etymologies, if you go and look up, I'm going to show you how to do that, um, probably it'll only be tomorrow, show you how to do that tomorrow. When you're looking up etymologies and you see that this comes from French, 99% of the time, you're going to go all the way back to Latin. So words of French origin, sure. But they themselves had their origins in Latin because that is a Romance language. The word Romance coming from? Romanus, that's it, the Romans. So it's not all about, you know, those red roses I'm going to get on Valentine's Day. No, at least I hope I am, but it's nothing to do with that, the Romance languages. So we look at orthography. Here's the first Greek word that I'm introducing you to. Orthos means correct or straight. Graphane is to write or record. So it's where the correct spelling is recorded. What is the correct spelling? So that's our fancy terminology for a conventional spelling system. And let's look at this, how difficult English is. There are 40 sounds in English, but more than 200 ways of spelling them. <laughs> Whoa, look at this. The sh sound. Sh in shoe, that's cool, that works. Sh in sugar. Well, where's the H gone then? Passion. Double S giving us the same sound. Ambitious. 
Not even an S except at the end. Ambitious. Ocean. We don't say the ocean. We've got the ocean. You've got to know that. You've got to know it's ocean is spelt like that, otherwise you're not going to win the spelling bee at all. Champagne, a CH, is giving us the same sound. We look at the O. It's not always an O. Look at it. Go, yes. Sto, O, W, gives us that. So, as in sewing your clothes, is S, E, W. Do, O, E. Though, O, U. Your English is a tricky thing, eh? Hey, the A, hey, is an E-Y. Hey, as an A-Y. Make, there you've got just a, a A. Made, A-I. Freight, E-I. Great, E-A. Uh -huh. Imagine if it was all phonetic, it would be very easy, but boring, I think, very boring. Okay, so we're wanting, we wanting standardization of spelling. What is gonna bring that to us? What's gonna force us to standardize spelling? Can't do it individually. Okay, it's not going to happen. Uh, it starts off individually. But uh, what is very important is this, the arrival. I'm not saying the invention of the printing press. I'm saying the arrival. Because William Caxton did not invent the printing press. He brought it over from Germany. And he studied the printing press over there for some time, brought it to uh, England, to Britain. And this was amazing. Suddenly, you've got an ability to have many, many, many copies of books uh, done all at one time. This is going to, number one, speed up literacy. People, the masses, will have access to reading. They want to learn to read now because actually they have a book. And actually they can afford that book. Books were expensive. Why were books expensive? Because they had to be hand copied by copyists, by scribes, in Latin, scribere, to write. And I think I have to show this to you. <laughs> Moment, please. Wait, we want to go up to projector screen now. I want this thing to go up now. Martian! He's from Mars. Oh, lordy. Okay. Back lights. No, no, no. I wanted to show you the origin of the question mark. Ah, oh, dear Lord. Mm. And in fact, there's no chalk either. Will you remember? So I'm not going to tell you the origin of the question mark. Okay, you remember tomorrow, first thing? Okay, and I will make sure that I have chalk and I can get to the board. Okay, so the arrival of the printing press, huge. Introduced by William Caxton, yep. And this accelerated literacy, Fabulous, fabulous. Because we do have some, wor some works now in English that people, the masses, want to read. This is g going to give us the imp impetus, the force, forcefulness to, to go on and standardize our um, spelling and our punctuation. And uh, there's really not much punctuation at that stage. All right. Uh, now, hmm. can we go on a little bit longer? Because I know you've got 15 minutes. Can we carry on? Okay, because I've been told I must stop and you must have questions. Okay, so we're going to go back to that word, that Latin word I gave you, nasci natus, what does it mean? To be born, to be born. Ah, renaissance, there it is. The French, they want to make it so different, so French, you know. If you were, we look in the dictionary, you will find renaissance, which is from exactly the same thing. The etymology say re means again. Naskinatus to be born, it's born again. This Renaissance period, cultural period, is a period of rebirth. What was the rebirth of? Very importantly, rebirth of interest in classical texts. That's it. Why? You've got the printing press suddenly. Now it's not just the scholars who can have access to reading Homer, Hesiod, Virgil, blah, 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 blah. No. You can actually have texts available for, this, for scholars on a wider scale, plus your English texts. People have uh, the opportunity to read these classical texts. They become very interested in the classical texts. But they couldn't read, they didn't know Latin and Greek, so they wanted these classical texts to be in English. So I want to read Virgil's Aeneid, but I want to read it in English. Yeah, yeah. I want to read the Iliad and Odyssey, but not in, not in Greek, uh -uh, in English. So who is going to English these texts? It's going to be the scholars, it's going to be the scribes. 
There is no standard English, a standard spelling at this time. So what we've got is one scribe. There's his text. He's been copying very diligently. And he gives it to another scribe. So there's another copy. And scribe number one can't read. The, the scribe number two can't read this word of scribe number one. So he has to ask him a question. So that's my tomorrow, you see. I'll tantalize you about that. And so you will find in, in uh, surviving works, old texts, and, uh, that there are spellings that differ for the, same, for the same text. It's because there was no standard. And people, there were many scribes uh, would come over from the French scribes because of, it was the Norman invasion. So the French uh, scribes were, were, were used as scholars. And they would write the word as they could hear it in the conventional sound that they had. Many of the printers were from Germany. And they, too, when they were posed with printing something, they would also say, OK, I think it is this. But another printer will say, no, no, no. He writes it a slightly different way before he's printing it. Uh, Caxton eventually decided that there would be what was called the London standard, that he made printers had to all uh, uh, abide by this particular la London standard. So he's bringing that in there. Um, OK, so classical texts are translated into English using now bringing in thousands and thousands of words of Latin and Greek origin. Because now, hmm, problem. Many of these words did not have an exact English synonym or equivalent. So you've got the, the, the scholar who is tasked with translating into the vernacular English, whose vocabulary, whose lexicon was not as vast. So what are you going to do? Well. You're going to simply English the word. In other words, make it look English. And the way we make things look English, take off the ending, put an anglicized ending on there, and then you can keep that word. And yay, we've got a new word. But this caused a terrible controversy. Because the people who were now so proud of their English heritage, the English language, they were the purists. They wanted to keep the language pure. I don't want these new words. If you can't find a word in English, in the English that we've got, then just don't use this foreign type word, okay? They were the linguistic purists. And they were opposing the neologizers. Another Greek word, neos means new, logos is word. The neologizers loved to bring in these new words. I said, it's enriching the language. Thomas Eliot, yes, we must bring in all these things. But there was this thing called the uh, um, inkhorn controversy. Okay, so this is what uh, was written about it. There was, in fact, a conscious effort on the part of many writers and scholars to enlarge the vocabulary of English and to make of their native tongue a means of communication to rival Latin. They were happy about this. The spread of education had produced a literate but semi Latinless public for whom translations of Latin literature were made. Anyone familiar with the process of translation will recognize that it is natural to translate a word with a word like itself. Often, the native equivalent does not occur at once, or there is no native equivalent. And rather than go through the whole long periphrases, the translator simply Englishes the Latin word. And so this allowed for thousands of words to march into the English vocabulary, which have their roots in Latin, and which will, of course, be the base to which we're going to talk about this, percentages of uh, words of Latin origin. English purists try to introduce words like this. Star law. They don't, I don't want astronomy coming from Greek. Star law. Speechcraft, instead of grammar. Inwit, instead of conscience. <laughs> On quicken instead of accelerate. <laughs> Gain rising instead of resurrection. Forsayer as a prophet. It's kind of reasonable, that one. Bird law as in ornithology. They prefer bird law. Uh, for soak is to absorb. <laughs> so we have taken all of these words, astronomy, resurrection, prophet, ornithology, we've taken them all. And we have accepted them into English. English now becomes the greatest borrower 
of all. And we just a little aside before we finish off there, we're almost up to one more thing I want to show you, is that for linguistic pedants, kind of like myself, I suppose, um, there's a similar controversy happening, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I think we've got to embrace it anyway, is where people say, oh, English is being corrupted by all of the social media and the Twitter and a this and a that, all oh, what's happening, all these things are coming in. Yes, you see, this is what's happening. English does not stop changing. English today in the 21st century is still bringing in all sorts of things, creating, but that is what its strength is, actually. So we will end on this last little bit here. Who's this fella? William Shakespeare. Well, he's my hero, really. William Shakespeare. We all have read the works of William Shakespeare, and uh, he was a master of linguistic originality. He was incredible. But even in his works, there were not necessarily the same spellings from one work to the next work to the next. There would be differences. Because, ah, oh, well, we look at, he, he, he had these following, he had six wills he, that he, um, he updated. And look at the, look at the um, here's the, or, or his actual signatures. There they are. And he had different spellings. Will, I am Shakespeare. William Shakespeare. Mm, Shakespeare. William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, okay. He used all of those in his various worlds, and people accepted it because there was no standard, so he's allowed to play around with that uh, as he liked. Uh, you know, looking, talking about the printers, Caxton as well, he, he had fellow, F-E-L-O-W-E, fellow, F-E-L-L-O-W, fellow, F-E-L-O-W, I mean, so we have, we're waiting for the dictionary. We're desperate for the dictionary. So here is William, master of linguistic or originality. He coined more than, coined about 2,000 words. Now this is, we're gonna talk about the evolution of vocabulary. You're gonna go and try and think, coin a new word, it's not easy. 2,000 new words, words that had never been used before or in that grammatical function before. It wasn't only just new words, sometimes a grammatical function. That was William. He used about 30,000 words. That's a very strong base of um, showing education. Let's look at some of his words. We'll end with that. Accommodation. Ah, clearly, when I look at accommodation, I look at uh, that is Latin-based. Yes, premeditated Latin-based. 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 Uh, um, Latin Greek. So he knew some Latin and Greek. He wasn't a big scholar of it, but he created words using the base thing. Assassination, he knew it comes from um, Arabic, but it was only assassin. That was all that was available at that time. And he made a different noun. Barefaced, countless, courtship, eventful, fancy free, premeditated, generous, <laughs> critical, inauspicious. So not all of these, the words he created stayed. I mean, when you read Shakespeare at school or at varsity, you were often reading it with um, the annotations. Because you come across a word and think, what the hell is that word? I don't know that word. You need it because those words dropped out, became archaic. So let's look at some of the dropouts. Abruption, <laughs> exufflicate, persistive, unplausive, protractive, propugnation, mistempered, out villained, irregulous. So these are words that did not see their way clear to, to say staying. And of course, he gave us many wonderful phrases. All right, we will leave it at that because you need a little bit of maybe question time. They tell me I must have some question time. So we'll pick it up tomorrow. We will be talking tomorrow about the uh, second very huge impact of, um, upon language, and that was the King James Bible. And then we're gonna move on uh, to other historical things and then after that evolution of English vocabulary, words per se. All right. Any questions, anybody? Yes? You told us about the number of words in different languages. How many words are there in African languages, like Hosa? Ooh, now you've got a good... I should have included that, but now I don't know. Uh, in Isikosa, yes. Um, oh, the question was, 
with all the other uh, statistics about numbers of words in a, a language, what about Isikosa or Zulu for that matter? Um, my, my feeling is it's going to be low, on the lower rung because they also were, they are uh, ling linguistically insular. What is happening is they're starting to, to absorb words from English, uh, you know, putting an E in front or something to, to kind of make it like Corsa, you see. Um, the, in the last round of adding South African words into the Oxford Dictionary, we had words from Corsa, uh, Mahala, meaning for free. We had, um, what other words coming? Uh, I can't think now, but but words that have got such strong currency in English that English is borrowing some words uh, from closer. But I'll try and find that question for you, uh, the answer to that question. What else? Anybody? Yes. I asked you, and uh, when you spoke about how uh, the great Welsh, uh. you used the name, which used to be not. Mm -hmm. And then you said, so the word spelling stayed the same, but because of the pronunciation, is that. Is that so the spelling stayed the same. And the pronunciation changed. And had we been, had we, the spelling moved with the pronunciation, we would have said for night, K-N-I-G, we'd have just dropped the K and said, well, it's, that's how I'm saying, spelling it now. I mean, even the G-H, we kept that G-H. We're not even pronouncing the G-H. We're saying, knicht, they did it. So there was a reason for the G-H. But, but for us, so that's the difficulty of our, our English spelling. In the E. Yeah, sorry, I'm just saying that the GH, GH had a reason, but the knicht, the E, was the vowel, which became an I. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you said that English is influenced by um, French and German and the, the Norse languages. Mm -hmm. What in turn influenced those languages, apart from Latin and Greek, of course? Hmm. They. Look, they all started off as the same Proto-Indo-European language. And then some groups migrated to Europe, some groups migrated to, to um, India. And the geographic dislocation forced them, caused them to change the language, that, the parent language. And when they went to different places, they made their own identity. So uh, all I can say is they were influenced by that Proto-Indo-European, and then they developed each of those three groups, slightly different dialects, and the same with the Vikings, slightly different dialects. But when we put them under what branch of language are we talking about, what, what family do you belong to, it's, those are all Germanic. Afrikaans belongs to Germanic as well. Dutch belongs to Germanic, OK? OK, sure. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that, just say it again, and I'm... Yes. We, I'll tell you where... You mean linguistically forcing changes upon us at that period? It, becomes, it comes way before that with the Noah Webster Dictionary, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, where there's a strong push towards uh, American identity, linguistically, as well as an, a powerhouse. So yes, in, in, in the world wars and things, globally, they would be interchanging words and, and uh, would come into, into it then too. Yes? Okay, so well, we're going to come to where do, do we choose I Z E? Do we choose I S E? Where does it come from? Does it come from Britain? Does it come from America? Where does it come from? A very interesting question, and I'll leave you with that thought tomorrow. Oh. <laughs>